Malone family, it is your sister in Christ, the Lady Summer, coming to you with another message. I wanted to deliver this one on Peter and Paul's feast today. The title of today's message is, We Judge by the Fruits. We test the Spirit by the Spirit as we were first judged. Anointed keys access to the heavenly realm. We are in judgment. Today is Wednesday, June 26. It is the day that my mother went to be with the Lord back in 1995. And it has always been a sad day for me until I got to 2000 and nine, I began to understand that we were not supposed to mourn as the world mourns. And there was no reason for me to mourn any longer because I knew that my mom was with the Lord. And you may say, well, what does this have to do with judgment? I'm going to get there. The word of the day is while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are external. Second Corinthians 4.18. And then my next scripture comes from Second Timothy. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness and that is what has happened over the centuries people have taken god's word and twisted it and changed the meaning and given their own meaning and set flame and fire to it so it burns in the minds of those who hear it (laughs) but that's just that itching ear stuff the scripture I just read to you comes from 2 Timothy 2, verse 14 through 16. And 2, 14 through 16, these are the days of my life that I will treasure as long as I have breath because they were the years of my awakening and the days of my visitation. And it just so happens on this anniversary of my mother's, I'm going to say, ascension, I had a dream about her. It was a very deep dream. It was beautiful. I won't um, reveal the contents in this message, maybe another. But on those days, 214 through 16, I received several scriptures during my visitation from the Holy Spirit, as well as the dream of all dreams. It was a dream that The Lord told me all my dreams were going to come true. Don't be afraid. He was going to be with me. And after that followed the seven letters to the seven churches written in Revelation. But Jeremiah 8, 7 says, Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. This scripture was given to me on February 14, 2018. It was Valentine's Day. It was also Purim. And it was also the Rosh Kadesh. All on one day. 214, 215-216. Next scripture was from Isaiah 38, verse 14. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fell with looking upward. 
O Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. So I was reading these words and saying these words, and I had no idea what at that time the Lord was trying to say to me. But that same year, in July and August, he instructed me to fast. My fast was for 40 days. Over this past month, I have been reviewing that 40-day fast, and today was day 32 of 40. And I had on here day 7 of 7, eternally with you, Bible plan. Take this to the bank and deposit it for safekeeping. God is always with you. Characteristic of God is described as omnipresent. Omnipresent means always present, everywhere, at the same time. When you feel alone or abandoned, remember that God is always with you, constantly, forever, and eternally with you. I was just talking to my son about this today. He is never not with me. He is next to me in my wilderness and has been even when I couldn't see him. God didn't abandon the Israelites. God is with me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. God didn't abandon David. And the promise was to him and his seed with regards to kingdom priests. We were not waiting for the Lord to come. He already came. We were waiting for the kingdom to come. And the kingdom is here. I also wrote, we know we're waiting well when we truly experience peace in God's pauses and plans. The peace is demonstrated in the resting of our thoughts and actions. Our real focus becomes a deep and abiding relationship with the person of our faith rather than manipulating our circumstances to receive the object of our weight. David waited well by focusing on God, not the problems, not the people, not the palace. That's what I wrote in 2018. And the scripture for that day was Isaiah 41, 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. 32 is the number of covenant. Covenant reveals the heart of the father and being about a father-son relationship. In Mark 8, 27, it was the 32nd time Jesus' name was mentioned again until the next chapter. After Peter's great confession that Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus explained to them the purpose of the Messiah, which is the messenger, is to establish the new covenant by means of his death and resurrection. Verse 31, a blood covenant. People are still saying, you're not supposed to judge. You can't judge. Who are you to judge? Well, we're going to hear about this in the scriptures because the word of God is the judge. And when you speak that word, it is what the judge meant. Okay? Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that we were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. And I want you to pay attention to very specific words. New Testament. Remember at the Last Supper, Jesus said, this is the New Testament in my blood. And there also he told them he would not drink of that again until in his kingdom, which going to get to that too. Where is this kingdom? Also notice that this is to very specific people. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So you have to be called. Deuteronomy 28 verse 12 says, The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven, to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Blessing the work of someone's hand is far beyond some physical work. He's also talking about scribe, the inkhorn. These are writers of his words that he gives to the individual who is called, predestined, chosen. What the Lord told Peter was a type and shadow of what he would bestow upon each of the blood-bought believers. They are the purchased possession because it is the gospel of their salvation. It's the gospel of our salvation. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And here are the key words, in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he have made us accepted in the beloved. Because remember, David, his name meant beloved. Mary, her name means beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he have abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he have purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, which we are here. I cannot believe you still have pastors saying he hasn't come yet. I heard Perry Stone in a video this morning say he hasn't come yet. I immediately stopped listening to the video because that means you don't know that he's here and he hasn't come to you. It's just not biblical. It says, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Because we're still in the process of being redeemed on the earth. See, once you were sealed, you were redeemed. And right now, God is confirming this word because I just said at the beginning, I wanted to release this word on Peter and Paul's feast day. Peter and Paul's feast day is June 29th. On our calendar, it would be the sixth month and the 29th month, right? 629. Well, there's absolutely no happenstance and no coincidence that 629 would be the strongest number for the word redemption, which also says the act ransom in full, i.e. figuratively riddance, or specially Christian salvation, deliverance, redemption. It says a releasing effected by payment of ransom because Jesus paid it all with his life. Redemption, deliverance, liberation procured by the payment of a ransom. It also says to redeem properly redemption, literally buying back from repurchasing, winning back what was previously forfeited or lost. It says a repurchase. It emphasizes the distance, the safety margin that results between the rescue person and what previously enslaved them. For the believer, it looks back to God's effective work of grace, purchasing them from the debt of sin and bringing them to their new status, being in Christ. And the first reference scripture, which is another confirmation, comes from Exodus 21, I was born on the 21st. A lot of things have always happened to me on the 21st. 21st is made up of three sevens, which has to do with the gospel of our salvation, being saved, God's perfect number, his completion, and his stamp of approval on a theme. Exodus 21, the first verse says, Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. And verse 8 says, If she please not her master, who have betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he have dealt deceitfully with her. The next scripture comes from Zephaniah 3. It's titled, Jerusalem's Danger. And the scripture it gives us one, it says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. Verse 2 says, She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. Then verse 3 says, Her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves, they gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Or says her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. But in verse 5, it says, The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning does he bring his judgment to light. He felleth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame and it is true that every time that the bible mentions jerusalem and zion and israel it uses the pronoun she and her the next verses come from number two where it says metaphorically everywhere in the new testament deliverance effected through the death of christ from the retributive wrath of a holy God and the merited penalty 
of sin. Because remember, we're talking about the New Testament in his blood. Remember, the Bible says he came not for the righteous, but to cause sinners to repentance. It gives Romans 3, 24, but I'm going to read 23 and 24. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So remember, you got to be in Christ Jesus because verse 25 says, whom God have set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 26, to declare, I say, to declare is to speak something or give a proclamation. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Jesus said he was the vine, we are the branches, and without him, we can do nothing. He is what the Bible calls God's saving gift. It's only because of him that we have grace. You can't work for grace, you can't buy grace, you can't steal grace, you can't bribe grace, you can't fool grace, and you cannot manipulate grace. It also gives Colossians 1 verse 14. I'm going to read verse 13 and 14. It says, oh, actually I'll read verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then when it's talking about the supremacy of Christ, verse 15 and 16 says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things and by him all things consist and it's no coincidence it's in verse 18 it says and he is the head of the body comma the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence and now we're going to get into this kingdom. The word kingdom in Greek is basilia. It comes from Strong's 932. Its definition is kingdom, sovereignty, and royal power. Its usage is kingship, sovereignty, authority, rule, especially of God, both in the world and in the hearts of men. Hence, kingdom in the concrete sense. Then it says Basilia comes from Basilius, king, properly kingdom, the realm in which a king sovereignly rules a kingdom, always requires a king as the kingdom of God does with King Jesus especially refers to the rule of Christ in believers' hearts, which is a rule that one day will be universal on the physical earth in the millennium. And we are here. So it is a reality at this moment that I'm speaking. It says the kingdom is constantly used in connection with the rule of Christ in the hearts of believers, which also extends 
in various stages. Further, it says royal power, kingship, dominion, rule. And one of the first scriptures that it gives is Luke 133. It also says a kingdom, i.e. the territory subject to the rule of a king, which it's the earth. We're going to get into that in a moment. Number three says in the New Testament, in reference to the reign of the Messiah, Messiah means messenger of God and has the following phrases, which again is the word Basilia from Isaiah 40 verse 9 and Micah verse 4, 7. We're going to read those two. It says properly the kingdom over which God rules kingdom of the Messiah, which is founded by God through the Messiah and over which the Messiah will preside as God's besitcherent. And that is only in Matthew, which I'm going to read next, but it says the kingdom of heaven is referred to most frequently, i.e. the kingdom which is of heavenly or divine origin and nature, which I just read to you earlier. It's the rule of God. It's a theocracy, not a democracy, because it was written that the Messiah would be one of David's descendants and a king very like David. And that is a confirmation of Daniel 2.44, which says in the time of these kings that the Lord was going to set up a kingdom on the earth that shall never end. And he did that. He made us kingdom priests for God on the earth. And once again, God is confirming my word as I'm speaking it in this strong definition of Basilia. It lists Ephesians 5.5 5, and it says relying principally on the prophecies of Daniel who had declared it to be the purpose of God that after four vast and mighty kingdoms had seceded one other and the last of them shown itself hostile to the people of God check at length its despotism its despotism should be broken and the empire of the world pass over forever to the holy people of God, the Jews. And look, it listed just the scriptures I just mentioned. I hadn't got here yet. It says Daniel 2.44, Daniel 7.14, Daniel 7.18, and Daniel 7.27. The Jews, kingdom of the greatest felicity, which God through the Messiah would set up raising the dead to life again and renovating earth and heaven and that in this kingdom they would bear sway forever over all the nations of the world this kingdom was called the kingdom of god or the kingdom of the messiah and in this sense must these terms be understood in the utterances of the jews because we are his blood and of the disciples of Jesus when conversing with him. Jesus employed the phrase kingdom of God or of heaven to indicate that perfect order of things which he was about to establish, and he did establish it, in which all those of every nation who should believe in him were to be gathered together into one society dedicated and intimately united to God and made partakers of eternal salvation. This kingdom is spoken of as now begun and actually present in as much as its foundations have already been laid by Christ and its benefits realized among men and women that believe in him. Additionally, it says in Matthew 13, verse 41, in this passage, its earthly condition is spoken of. 
in which it includes bad subjects as well as good. Also, the essence of the kingdom of God is not to be found in questions about eating and drinking, but far more frequently the kingdom of heaven is spoken of as a future blessing since its consummate establishment is to be looked for on Christ's solemn return from the skies. Check. Already happened. The dead being called to life again. Check. Already happened. The ills and wrongs which burden the present state of things being done away. Happening. Evil is being overcome. And also the powers hostile to God being vanquished. They are perishing. The wicked are perishing. The evil devices are being destroyed. The truth is being declared. Remember in Revelation it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life to the death. Meaning they loved God more than anyone and anything else. Check. I will post this Strong's number 932 in the description box. This isn't the first time that I have given this information that is relevant for today's message. And Jesus answered and said unto him, him being Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew six seventeen through 19 Again, it's an alignment. 16, 17, 18, 19. These were the years. The year of the dream. The year of the implementation. The year of transformation. And then the new. Because the old was passing away. And it was the old way of doing things. New was appearing. He said, I've already done it. Don't you see it? It's springing forth. And even with the thing about summer, summer being nice, summer at hand, because I found out that during Moses' time of grain and harvest, the Nile rose, the waters of the Nile rose and created a flood during the summer months from June to September. And then as the water receded, they would plow the ground, they would plant the seed, and then the harvest would be in spring. Yeah, I was reading this book um, called The Everyday Life in Bible Times. I read something else very interesting. It said that the Pharisees believed in angels and the resurrection of the dead and immortality of the soul, but they denounced Jesus for fraternizing with sinners and for laxity in observing the Sabbath. He, in turn, spoke of them as hypocrites who strain a neck and swallow a camel and who neglect judgment, mercy, and faith. The differences between Sadducees and Pharisees do not weaken the vital Jewish religion. Even Jews seduced by Greek or Roman custom cling to strict monotheism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, begins the Shema in the daily prayer. The law also teaches thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Neighbor generally is interpreted as a fellow Israelite, a member of God's chosen people whose males carry the sign of God's covenant on their bodies by being circumcised. Further, it said Judaism is a closed community protecting the treasure of its faith 
by keeping away from Goyim, which are Gentiles, and the pagans. If you want to read that book, you can go to the Internet Archive and sign up. As well, there are other books. But the rock that Jesus spoke of building his kingdom was the third rock from the sun, what we call the earth. Psalm 67 has seven verses. It says, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah, that thy way may be known upon earth. Thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. That's the second time it says upon earth. Selah, let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase and God even our own God shall bless us God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him the word bless comes from Strong's 1288 and the word is Barak it means to kneel to bless and it says blessed is blessed bless me indeed blessed be those who bless blessed is everyone who blesses <laughs> it says congratulate greatly bless persisted in blessing and it says kneel kneel and bless he kneeled down he kneeled upon us his knees let us kneel before Yahweh, or bless. To kneel is to bless. And it also says, bless God and adore with bended knees. And it makes me think about something that happened with me in my room back at that time. I think it was in 2017. No. Hmm. It was actually in 2019. I got down on my knees in my room and I said, Lord, I'm going to kneel first because all of the world is going to kneel. So let me be the first to kneel and bow and confess that you are Lord. And at the moment that I did that, my room shook like there was an earthquake. I thought it was an earthquake and I heard a boom. And so next thing I know, my daughter-in-law is knocking at my door. And she's like, is everything okay? Are you okay? I heard a noise. I said, there was no earthquake. You guys didn't feel a shaking. She said, no, we just heard a loud boom and a noise coming from your room. I said, wow. Let me get back to the message because I don't want it to be super long today. First Corinthians 2, again, 2, verse 12 to 16. Something happened to me. From February 12th onward, actually all of February in 2018 was on literal spiritual fire. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. This is what the Pharisees were witnessing during Jesus' visitation. When the Lord came in the body of Jesus Christ, that was the Father God visiting the earth again. And those Pharisees, because they were not in the spirit, not living holy, but they were going through the motions, but their heart wasn't in it. They didn't recognize the time of their visitation. So the things that Jesus was saying and doing was foolishness to them. 
So it says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's why Jesus told Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Because it was the Spirit that told Peter who Jesus was, because he was testing the Spirit. He was always asking questions and listening intently for the answer and watching the things that Jesus was saying and doing. It says, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. I'm going to read it again. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. And it's not being spiritual outside of the word because I've heard that ignorance too, especially in this last month. I'm spiritual. I don't need some old ancient book and fairy tales to give me the truth. Well, you're calling the Lord God Almighty ancient and fairy tales because the Bible is clear that the word was amongst us in the flesh and that he left that same word and had those that he gave it to to write down that same word so that we at this time in the fullness of time in the millennium can live out that thing and have the kingdom and all its righteousness here upon the earth then it says but he that is spiritual judges all things yet he himself is judged of no man for who have known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It's a part of the New Testament. He said, I'm going to make a New Testament wherein I'm going to write the words of the book in their hearts. You know what you don't forget? You don't forget a personal experience. You don't forget things that have happened to you. This is what it says in Psalm 37. And listen to the verses 21 and 22. Gospel of your salvation and revelation. The wicked borrow and pay it not again. But the righteous showeth mercy and give it. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. And they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. That's what I read over and over and over. The Holy Spirit was leading me. Before I had all of these books, before I had any of this knowledge, the Holy Spirit was saying things to me that I had not seen and didn't have proof of. And one of those things was, it doesn't say that the righteous will perish or the righteous are going to disappear. The Bible says over and again that the wicked will perish and the righteous will be saved. And yes, there are some people that we look on the outside and we say, well, that person, they were perfect and they did this and, and we know that they were blessed. How do you know? The Bible says only the Lord searches the reins of the heart. He's the only one who knows and sees all which is why we are told not to give place to the devil, not to give him an opportunity to have that snare placed in front of us or a trap. And we were always supposed to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, keeping our feet on a path of righteousness for his name's sake and using wisdom so we know which way to go what door to enter, what door to close, what door to walk through, knowing that in all these situations, for those who are the chosen and called and believe and have the blood, he is there with you every step of the way. They had us looking for glasses that we already had on the top of our heads. We just needed to pull them down over our eyes so that we could see in the spirit psalm 86 verse 5 says for thou lord art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy 
unto all them that call upon thee. Matthew 4, verse 8 through 11 says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. This right here is exactly what is happening today. It happened from that time forward as an example to us. And actually, Jesus did what he could not do in the garden. It was the same situation because he came to her with challenging words he was challenging god's words in jesus's case the devil was tempting him just as eve was being tempted in the garden with eating a fruit but jesus said nah i don't need your stuff get behind me say i don't need anything from you and at that point he had to leave because he knew jesus is not going for any of this that i'm saying because jesus knew who he was and he loved his father our father james 4 7 says submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you we work together with god because salvation was bought by the blood of jesus christ you have to choose to participate he offers you blessings and cursings you have to choose which one I choose him and I choose his blessings and his blessings are the fruit of the spirit. And that is how you identify how someone is living. If it's a person, I don't want to hear the word. Don't talk to me about that. Turn that off. They are not of God. I don't care if they say Lord, Lord every day. I don't care if they go to the quote unquote church building. I don't care if they got the TV on. And Bible study is playing in the background for 24 hours. It doesn't matter. They are not a believer. First John 4, 6 says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Then in 1 John chapter 5, again, listen to the verses 19 through 21. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the son of God is come and have given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son jesus christ this is the true god and eternal life little children see whenever it says little children it's talking about the children of israel little children keep yourselves from idols amen that's first john 5 19 through 21 then romans 8 14 through 16 says for as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And you can read Galatians 5, so you will understand when you're talking to people, how to identify if they are in Christ or if they are not. It's not about anti-Semitism. It's about whether they're an antichrist. Isaiah 10 verse 12 through 14 says, Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart 
of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. For he saith, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. And that's what they did with slavery, with colonization, with the writing of man's laws. Because man's laws and God's laws are two different things. And you know what really tripped me out is how people can say, Ah, I'm not going to read that Bible. It was written by men. But you follow the law that was written by men? What kind of sense does that make? Going back to... Isaiah 10 verse 15 says, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? As if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up. Or as if the staff should lift up itself. As if it were no wood. Therefore, shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire, and the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame, and it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day and shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field both soul and body and they shall be as when a standard bearer fainted and the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few that a child may write them I'm going to keep going in verse 20. It says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but they shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In truth, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God because that was the return returning to him that's why he kept saying return to me return to me he sent Jesus so you could return to him the mighty God the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is in them above them and beneath them there is no other and he says, for though thy people, this is in verse 22, Revelation, for though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them a return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Verse 23, for the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determined, listen, in the midst of all the land. Again, something happening down here on earth because this is where the kingdom is. This is why David was used as an eternal example. And verse 24 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion. And remember, Zion is a community of holy watchers. Be not afraid of the Assyrian." He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee, after the manner of Egypt, for yet a very little while. And the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. This is one of the first books that I learned after I was baptized when I was 19, Titus 3, 4, and 5. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared 
not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And I just keep hearing that song, the lion won't sleep tonight, cause he woke now, cause he woke now. That word regeneration is the word palingenesia. I know I'm jacking it up, sorry. It comes from Strong's 3824. It's spelled P-A-L-I-G-G-E-N-E-S-I-A. The definition is regeneration and renewal. And the usage is, listen, a new birth. Regeneration again renewal it says properly the coming of new birth because born again regeneration that is what the regeneration is it is the rebirth of the physical creation at christ's return which inaugurates his millennial kingdom the rebirth all believers experience at conversion now being born on resurrection sunday i don't really know how much more (laughs) the new birth and the rebirth can be (laughs) expounded upon but i accepted christ as my lord and savior when i was 12 years old and i began trying to live for him from that age forward But I'm going to say my true born again experience was during the time of those years, 19, 20, and 21, because that's when I discovered that God was real and he really does save and that I was seeing my dreams were coming true, that when I called upon him, he was saving me. I was born for a specific purpose and that purpose was to live a holy life. With this regeneration, they give two scriptures um, beyond Titus 3, 5, which is Matthew 19, 28, and Romans 8, 18 through 25. Further, it says reproduction and recreation. It says moral renovation, regeneration, the production of a new life consecrated to God, a radical change of mind for the better effected in baptism. It is the restoration of the being to its pristine state, its renovation as the renewal or restoration of life after death. And it was on February 19, 2014 that my spirit left my body I was touched and told to wake up, and I've been awake ever since. I know that I am living in the regeneration because Christ is seated on his throne, and the words that are in this Bible are judging the children and the tribes of Israel. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away behold all things are become new and jesus said unto them verily i say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the son of man shall sit in the throne of his glory you also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel this word is the judge Peter wrote, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And his glory being revealed is when we give honor to Christ as the Son of God, the Father receives glory. It says, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, 
for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, we're called the house of God. Believers, those chosen, the blood. It says, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? I'm going to tell you what the end shall be. Job 36 verse 12 says, But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. So he said, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? They won't. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. That was 1 Peter 4. Listen to the verses 12 through 19, which lines up with Revelation 12 through 19. Because he did a new thing. Women were not allowed to be in the priesthood but they were allowed to be prophets then the woman came she appeared in heaven later she you know she's fighting the enemy she's being taken over into the wilderness to be fed she comes back she fights the enemy the earth swallows up all the false doctrine and then she appears in 19 putting on the priestly garments and she comes right on back down the Father sends her from heaven. The Holy Spirit is wisdom. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32 says, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. We can judge them because we are walking in the Spirit. The Lord is with us. We have knowledge of the Word. It's in our heart. We are displaying the fruits and we see their lack of fruit. We got the warning from Paul. We got what to look for from Paul. He said, This know also that in the last days we're here, perilous times shall come. Check, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away that was our warning and our little test sheet and you know a test there's only two things that can happen from a test you either pass it or you fail it and then you get your grade right and depending on what you're doing going to a class or whatever you're doing <laughs> you get the reward or you know move forward or pass or don't pass and get the consequences of your action you won't be able to do this and that same thing you don't pass god's test then you don't have the blessing of his presence or the blessings and benefits that come from relationship with him as it said later evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived but continue thou in the things which thou 
has learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou has learned them, and that from a child thou has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in 